Welcome back to another week of Sabbath School. This morning, I want to start out with a little game called Predator and Prey. Have you ever watched a nature video where they show an epic chase between a fast cat and an unsuspecting gazelle? I want you to think about those kind of pictures in your mind this morning as we play our game. Like I said, it's called Predator and Prey. What you'll see pop on your screen after my face gets out of the way will be two words and they'll be scrambled. One of them will be red and the other one will be blue and they'll be separated by an and sign. The red one represents a predator, but its letters are all mixed up and on the other side represents the prey. It'd be in blue. So what you have to do in those 10 seconds is reorganize those letters in your brain and try to guess what the predator and prey combination correctly. If you feel like you don't have enough time, feel free to just pause it. There will be a little timer in the bottom part of the screen counting down those 10 seconds. Some of them have hints. So if you pause before the 10 seconds because you don't know it yet, when you come back there might be a hint or there might be the answer. So if you're playing with the group, feel free to pause and let's see how many you can get correct. Are you ready? Let's pray. Predator and prey.
the game? Did you get caught up on any of the words? Well, maybe like crustacean or hippopotamus? I hope you had fun playing it and I wonder how many you got correct. Well, the reason I wanted us to play that game is I wanted us to start thinking. It was almost like every time when you saw a prey, I don't know about you, but I could just think of immediately the next animal down the food chain. Each predator has to consume in order to live. But has it always been like this? Have you ever considered why that in order to live, in order for animals and for humans to exist, we find the need to consume the resources around us? Will it always be like this for you and me? I want to invite you to open up your Bibles this morning and to dig in to the book of Isaiah. We're going to be in chapter 11 in the book of Isaiah. We'll watch a short little video about that chapter, and then we're going to do a little bit of discussion and follow it up with some application. So open up your Bibles this morning to Isaiah 11, verse 1 through 9. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All right, let's waste no time. Let's dig into this. So I want to connect last week with this week. Last week we finished off talking about the beginning of the ministry of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet of God to the children of Israel right before they were taken into exile, into Babylon, into Assyria. And that's where we get the stories of like Daniel and we get the prophet Jeremiah in this period too. Well, Isaiah had been given a prophecy that Israel needed to be cut down like a tree and that there was going to be a stump at the end of this tree and that there would be life in the stump and then a shoot would come up, a branch would come up and that's what we heard at the beginning of our chapter today. A branch is going to come up and where does that branch come from? Well, this branch comes from the stump, the root of Jesse. Now, who was Jesse? Jesse was David's dad and David was king of Israel and Jesus came in the lineage of David. But we could have used a lot of different words to describe Jesus. We could have used words like the lion of the tribe of Judah to describe him coming with power. Or we could have said he's the Davidic king. You know, he's this, he's this rightful heir to the throne. But we used Jesse as the clue for the origin of the Messiah. And who was David when he was just the son of Jesse? He was a shepherd, a humble shepherd. And that's a picture of the Messiah that we're gonna kind of dig in today, this shepherding, this caring, this loving Messiah, the Christ who was gonna come and set Israel free. 
Now, in verse 2 of chapter 11, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. That's one, Spirit of the Lord. Two, Spirit of wisdom, Spirit of understanding. Four, the Spirit of counsel. Five, the Spirit of might. Six, Spirit of knowledge. And the last one, Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now, when the Bible starts talking in sevens, we got to pay attention. we got to perk up our ears. When we were playing the game of the predators and the prey, did you think about the rainbow by any chance? The first thought that came to mind when I was thinking about predators and prey was like, where did it all come from? It came from when the whole earth was flooded and God promised that, well, there was going to be predators and prey then and that, and that the fear of humanity was going to be put into the animals and that we could eat meat at that point uh, because all the vegetation was dead. Well, along with that same story came a rainbow. Have you guys ever seen a rainbow? I positively love them. One of my friends posted this week online of a beautiful picture and she said, promise kept. And God, that's what he did. He made a promise and he's like, every time you see this beautiful display of colors in the sky, Remember that I'm a promise-keeping God, and I'll never again cover the whole earth in water. I want to kind of take that. Let's use the illustration of the rainbow. How many colors are in the rainbow? Seven colors. Roy G. Biff, right? I want to use the illustration of the rainbow to understand this sevenfold spirit of God. So, question, how are rainbows made? Well, you see, light comes from the sun. Perfect white light comes from the sun. And our clouds and the moisture in the atmosphere after a rain form almost like a prism. When, it, when light hits a prism, like you see in this picture here, when light hits a prism, the white light refracts. It reflects off of a surface at a different angle. And when white light hits a prism, that refraction spreads it out into a spectrum of visible light. So we get to see all the way from red light we can't see infrared but we can see from red light all the way through these beautiful colors all the way through like a violet with those seven colors i want to use this illustration to understand god's spirit so it says in john chapter one in him was life and the life was the what the light of men the light shines in the darkness and the darkness is not does not overcome it verse nine the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So this is John talking about Jesus. Jesus was coming into the world, and he uses the illustration of light. It isn't that there are seven different spirits of God, so don't hear what I'm not saying. There's not seven different spirits of God. Rather, there are seven, there are seven characteristics of the Spirit of the Lord, and that Jesus possessed them in fullness. He takes this light, and he shows us the spectrum of God's love. So let's dig into it. The sevenfold spirit of God. So what were those seven? We have the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So first one, spirit of the Lord. It was not a false spirit that Jesus came in, not a deceiving spirit or even just the spirit of a man. But the Spirit of the Lord, God of Israel, rested upon the Messiah. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we see this in Jesus' life. You know, Jesus fulfilled this. He was setting everybody free. Jesus stands up in the tabernacle one day and opens up the scroll of Isaiah, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord has sent me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to set at liberty the captives. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there was freedom. And Jesus was of the Spirit of the Lord, and he knew it. That next spirit, the spirit of wisdom. Jesus is perfectly wise in all things, and he showed it among us during his earthly ministry. Talking about that, Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 1.30, and because of him, you are in Christ. Because of who? Him? Jesus, right? We are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. 
righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So we see that it isn't just that Jesus had wisdom or has wisdom. He is wisdom. He was this gift of wisdom, of understanding, of deep knowledge that God gave to the human race. God gave himself and this wisdom to humanity. Well, what's that next spirit? The next spirit is the spirit of understanding. He is perfectly suited. Jesus is. He's perfectly suited to be our sympathetic high priest in heaven because of his deep understanding, because he had the spirit of understanding. Hebrews 4 describes it this way in verse 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in, in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. God wanted to establish a connection, a binding relationship with the human race. So he's in Jesus to live like you and me. And Jesus, he walked the same path we did. He laced up our sandals and he walked the perfect life. And now because he's done all that, because he's tasted the same things we experience, fatigue, stress, hatred, because he's experienced all of those things, he can now minister to us in perfect understanding of who we are. Jesus understands all things and he understands us perfectly. So what's the next one? The spirit of counsel. The spirit of counsel. God gifted to our human race a human child, God's only son, to bring the perfect counsel that existed between father and son to you and to me, to us. In Isaiah 6, it says this, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Uh, it's like he's gifted to us. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Anytime we run into situations in our life that we lack understanding, we lack wisdom, we see that God has perfect counsel for us. Have you ever been counseled by somebody, maybe a school counselor or a pastor or a good friend or parent? who's come alongside of you when you were feeling down or confused and just been willing to sit with you and listen, to share with you life-giving words to point you in the right direction. This is the counsel that Jesus is talking about. He is our wonderful counselor. What's the next spirit? The next spirit that was upon Jesus was the spirit of might, the spirit of might. He has the mighty power to do what he desires to do. He's almighty God. He, he speaks and things come into existence. So what was he doing here on planet earth? How was he showing his mighty power here? In Romans 1 verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And that gospel word is, could be translated as the good news. And what's that good news? It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Not just you, not just me, but to everyone who believes. Many would help us if they could, but are powerless. Others may have the power to help us, but they don't care about us. Jesus has both the love and the might to help us. When two countries are warring against each other, I don't know if you guys have studied in history, but there's been many wars of very strong countries and very weak countries going at odds over territory or political strife. You know, at some point in these wars, or where both sides see that they're not getting anything out of it, they're losing more than they're gaining, and they start initiating peace talks. Now imagine, if one of the countries in this battle is like super strong, and then the other one is like super weak, and he's holding on by the skin of his teeth. When it comes to this time, who do you think is gonna initiate peace talks? Do you think it, the stronger country is going to initiate peace talks or the weaker one? The weaker country because they're seeing that they could stand to lose the whole war if they don't initiate, they don't take that first step to getting peaceful negotiations so that they can consolidate their losses. The Bible describes that we were enemies with God when we were sinners and God being all powerful, this mighty God and us being sinners and so minuscule and finite. It would be logical that we would initiate peace talks. Like, okay, God, let's, let's settle this thing once and for all. But we didn't. 
Our pride got in the way. Sin polluted our brains so that we didn't even think about coming to God to find peace with him. But rather, the Bible describes God, this almighty God, takes the first step to initiate peace. The Bible says that, the Bible says, but God who is rich in mercy, while we were still his enemies, while we were still sinners, he signed a peace treaty with the blood of his own son. And you know what? That document signed by the blood of God's only son is still on the table for you and me. Signed, ratified, it's still good today, waiting for your signature. So let's look at the next spirit. Two more to go. You're doing great. Knowledge, the spirit of knowledge. Jesus was the only being to ever experience intimate, the intimate knowledge of the Father. John chapter 10, 27 and 28 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus, in this perfect knowing relationship, and when we say knowledge, we're talking more like more than just head knowledge. We're talking about like heart knowledge, like intimate understanding between two people, that to know somebody. Jesus came to shepherd us into the knowledge of God, into this intimate connection, so that we could one, know him, but secondly, to be fully known by him. Humanity, we had an intimate knowledge with something else. We knew sin and the kingdom of darkness. Jesus possessed intimacy with the Father from the creation of the world and didn't consider that it was something to be held onto. But the Bible says instead that Jesus laid aside his kingly garments. He laid aside his position in heaven and God made him who never knew any sin to become sin for you and for me. The last spirit. Jesus willingly kept himself in the place of submission, respect, and honor to God. He had the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Christian life begins when, in the fear of the Lord, we die to our old life. And we honor his welcome to live as sons and daughters of God. Now in verse 3 of chapter 11, we get to see the next phase of this ministry that God promised through Isaiah would be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. God has gifted him to us. In verse 3 it says, He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes on what his ears hear. The Bible says something cryptic here that, you know, most of the time human judges, or like you and me, we judge based off our what we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears. But the Bible is giving us a clue that God's judgment or the judgment that happens in Jesus is far deeper than that. We get a clue for this too. You remember when David was called to be king of Israel when he was anointed? The prophet Samuel came to Jesse's house and Jesse lines up all of his sons there in front of him and he brings them by one by one and, and the prophet Samuel says, but this man here, this strong, tall, this is definitely the guy God chose to be king. He was judging with his eyes and with his ears. He was looking at the outward appearance. But look, let's see what God says to him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have actually rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the out, on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we get this picture of the judgment that the Messiah is going to bring is gonna be far deeper than just what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears. This judgment is gonna to come to a culmination one day. And the book of Isaiah in verse four gives us a picture of that. So let's, Check out this quick, quick Venn diagram and try to figure this out. So I put two other verses up on the screen. So the verse, first one at the top, let's read the first one at the top. It says, but righteousness, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide the equity of the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Ooh, some strong language. But at the beginning of that we see that he judges righteousness for those who are poor. He, gives equity 
to the meek of the earth. Have you ever been scared by judgment? I hope what we go over in the next couple minutes kind of helps you on the beginning of this pathway to move away from fearing judgment and seeing that judgment is actually good news. It's actually really good news because God is saying that there's something wrong with this world. If you know deep in your heart, you've seen this too. There's something wrong with the world around us. And God's saying, I'm not going to let this go on forever. The poor, the meek, the lowly of this world aren't going to be taken advantage of forever. And let's look at these other two verses. And this is going to give us the answer of who, when, and then the lawless one. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. All right, first, who that? Who that going to stand up against God's saints? Who thinks they can stand up against it? Well, who are the wicked that are going to be destroyed? First, we see in 2 Thessalonians that it's the lawless one. The lawless one who will be revealed and that Jesus will kill. And then up here in in Isaiah, we hear, we see, he shall kill them. He'll kill the wicked with the breath of his lips. Wow. So we see the destruction of the wicked definitely present in these two verses. All right, so when? When's this all going to happen? Let's take our focus to the bottom two verses of this uh, little Venn diagram. When is it going to happen? At the second coming. First, at the end of 2 Thessalonians, we see that the, at the appearance of his coming, these things are going to be brought to nothing at the appearance of his coming. And then in 1 Thessalonians, it leads out with, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Okay, so we got... Who's going to be destroyed, right? The wicked and the lawless one. And then when's it going to happen? At the appearance of the Lord, at the, at the time where he descends out of heaven. And where are we? Let's go. Come on. So we see in these two verses that God is promising salvation to whom? To the righteous, to the poor, and to the meek of the earth. He gives judgment to us. He, he decides equity in our case. Oh, awesome. And then in the bottom verse, it says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Last week, we talked about that awesome preposition of being in Christ. And that even if we lose our mortal life here on earth, our life is hidden with Christ in heaven. So when's this going to happen? Well, it's going to happen at the second coming. The, the wicked are going to be destroyed. God's going to put an end through Jesus, through his perfect judge, who doesn't judge on outward appearances. He judges in favor of the saints, in favor of those who are righteous because Jesus is righteous, not because of anything they have done or anything I have done or you've done, but because Jesus is righteous and we've accepted him into our lives as the meek and the poor and the lowly of this world. Say what? It's a call of love that brings the sin in. The breath of his mouth, literally like the breath that comes out of his mouth brings this thing to a close. And you look, the breath of his mouth is what comes out of Jesus' mouth, is what kills the lawless one. You catch that? In 1 Thessalonians, the cry of a command, the voice of the archangel, the, the sound of a trumpet, is what brings the dead to life. God's breath, in the same action, puts an end to the wicked, brings back to life those who are righteous, and again, in verse 11, it, he, he strikes the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. All three of these things, it seems like, are happening simultaneously. God sets in right order this whole problem that sin has created. All in his second coming, this loud cry that goes throughout the whole earth. It sets us free and it puts an end to sin. It's not just us who are waiting for this. In Romans 8, verse 19, it gives us a picture that nature as well is waiting. Nature waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For you and me to be revealed in the correct standing that we have before the Father. Nature too. You know, you can't ignore it. Jesus told us not to ignore it. He didn't tell us to set dates based off of it. But he said, look around at nature. Nature's going to heave and hove like a woman who's going into labor. 
and it's going to get more and more and more intense. These are just signs for us to know that this is coming to an end. Now, verse 9 is where I want to wrap this up. You know, leading up to this, you see this complete reversal of everything we've known. The predator-prey mentality is completely reversed. Jesus says that the predator and the prey are going to lay down together and there will be peace between two things we've never seen peace and then a young child is going to lead these ravenous predators alongside of their prey together and there will be this amazing peace and it says that they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, I got a question for you. When did Jesus stop being human and start being God again? Did it happen at the cross? Did it happen when he was resurrected? Did it happen when he ascended? It's a trick question. It's a trick question to ask when Jesus stopped being human and became God. He was always both and is always both. Isaiah was promised that God would give a Messiah. And that Messiah came and he lived like you and me and he lived in our world and he turned the world upside down. What we thought before was power and strength, being boastful and pushing around and living at the expense of others, it gets flipped upside down and Jesus this lowly servant who dies on a cross becomes the savior of the world. But he's not done there, right? Because somehow this human God person who got killed on a cross gets resurrected and he goes back to heaven in human form. And then we learn in the book of Revelation that the tabernacle of God is going to be with men. Is it surprising to you to know that God's eternal kingdom will be here on planet Earth when God remakes all, all creation brand new again? It's true. Jesus has been given to us as a gift to humanity, not just for the 33 years that he lived here on Earth, but forever. And since Jesus has been given to humanity, since he is both God and human, he has to live where humans live. And that's planet Earth. God is going to make the very ground and soil that you're standing on the center of his eternal kingdom. He is establishing a kingdom in your heart and in my heart today. You know, there are some people who took this message who realized that what Isaiah was saying had come true in Jesus. And his name was Jason, and he, he provided a home for Paul during Paul's ministry in, uh, in his area. And this was found in, this, this story is found in Acts 17. Well, while Jason's providing this place for Paul, the people around us get all stirred up, right? They get so angry, they come pounding on Jason's door, you know? Like, Jason, open up. I know that Paul guy is in there. And he comes to the door and they grab him. They can't find Paul. Well, they bring Jason and his brother, his, the brethren, before the people, the leading people of the town. And they have this accusation to say about him. They said, these men have turned the world upside down and have come here also. Jesus wants you to live in the reality of an upside down world where humility is strength, where forgiveness is power, and where love is the only controlling power in your heart. God wants you to, to so be engrossed in his love that you see in the world, everybody around you, you see people who he's died for. He wants you to be his ministers to this world, not to earn salvation. No, because he has earned salvation for you. He has purchased the right for you and me to be called his sons and to go and find other people who are also his children and to bring them into this kingdom. 
That's the challenge today. Turn your world upside down. Live with the security that you have in Jesus and change the world for him. Let's bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so humbled, but yet so excited to know that you love us. You love us beyond anything we could ever imagine. You are a promise-keeping God. You told Isaiah way back when that you were gonna come and you were gonna change this world forever. And Lord, we thank you so much that you're continuing to prove that through humble little Christians like me and those listening this morning. Lord, show your love, show your power, show your forgiveness and your mercy through our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again for joining us for Sabbath School. I had a good time and I hope you carry this message to other people and show God's love in a real way to those around you. Have a good week.